Can you guys hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Excellent. Well, I suppose uh, we can start now. Uh, good evening, everybody, from a rainy day here in uh, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. It's uh, just past uh, 7 p.m. And uh, I'm delighted uh, to be hosting uh, tonight's uh, guest. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, notes before we start today's uh, talk is um, you've got a chat uh, option that's available. Please make sure that you uh, state your name clearly and also your affiliation. Uh, some of you have been messaging me privately. I am not sure if that is because you want your names to be anonymous or uh, if you are doing so by, by mistake. But if you'd like your comments to be available to everybody, make sure you uh, choose the message everyone uh, option. Um, just a quick reminder, I host these talks twice a week. Uh, on Wednesdays, like today, uh, the talks are exclusively about art. And on Saturdays, the talks are about social, uh, maybe economic issues. Last week, we had Dr. Ziad Dawood, whose talk is available on Saturday. Next Saturday, we have a speaker who will come and talk about the role of technology in the pandemic. What is the role of technology in the pandemic? We have someone senior here from Dubai who will be, who will be speaking, and I will share the poster tomorrow. Um, I just need to find my guest speaker here so I can unmute him. Um, okay, so I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, once again, it gives me great pleasure to be welcoming uh, our, uh, our speaker today. There we go. Share screen. So I'll be introducing uh, our, uh, our speaker in a second. So um, our speaker actually is not too far from us here in the UAE. He's in, uh, he's in Bahrain. Uh, Abdurrahim Sharif is an old friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for about uh, maybe close to 12 or 13 years. Uh, Abdurrahim Sharif was born in Bahrain in 1954. He studied in Paris at the uh, Ecole uh, Nationale Supérieure the Beaux Arts, so the, the National High Art School in, in Paris in the 1970s, before going on to New York, where he obtained a master's in fine arts de uh, degree from Parsons School of Design. Uh, Abdurrahim Sharif uh, is one of the most prominent uh, uh, artists from the Gulf. Uh, in fact, I would like to read to you a, a short introduction that was written about him by an important uh, art critic, an art historian, Dr. Maha Sultan, who uh, is a critic and professor at the Institute of Fine Arts at the Lebanese University. So she says about Abdurrahim Sharif, he's a master of his artistic domain. Abdurrahim Sharif portrays a potent skill when handling his visual instruments, so deeply infused by a lustful and boundaries-free world of manipulative passion and discovering a new chemistry amongst colors. So who is Abdur Abdurrahim Sharif? Uh, he is an artist that uh, uh, I very much admire. Uh, I am unmuting him now. And without further ado, let me just uh, make sure that you can all see him. OK. Abdurrahim Sharif, yes. Oh, I see your questions are already coming in. Oh, boy. There we go. Sadat Abdurrahim, are you there? Can you unmute your uh, your mic? Yeah. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Father Sadat Abdurrahim. Uh, can you please correct that image, uh, Sultan? Because yes, I'll do that right away now. I'm just spotlighting you. Sadat okay. Abdurrahim Sharif, uh, this work dates back 50 years. So this is, uh, you've, even despite you being very young, your career has this year passed 50 years exactly. This is the 50th anniversary of the beginning of your career. Uh, this canvas going back to 1970, the beginning of your career, it, it looks like it's inspired by Gulf art. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Actually, uh, first, hello to everybody. Hello. Uh, this painting, uh, which I did at the time that 
there was really village space in Bahrain. And this is the first painting that I did outdoor. Of course, before this, there are some works that I did because I started painting uh, when I was nine years old. But this painting, you know, a lot of like failures and little success. But then uh, this painting, which dates 1970, uh, was the experience of carrying material outside where a lot of villagers were following me and I asked the girl if she could stand in front of me. So this painting, uh, uh, which I titled it Villager with Buchnag, uh, Buchnag is, you know, the, the black thing she wears that covers the head uh, to sort of the starting of the arm. Usually they have golden ornament in the middle. Uh, so, you know, this is one of the paintings of those years where I was like uh, some 15, 16 years old. Yes. Abdurrahim, we see that in this work, the theme of the Gulf scenes continues with you. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah. Uh, you know, in 1970, just, just after I did that painting, unfortunately, my father died. And I had to um, sort of quit painting because there was no time for, uh, for it and because I wanted to make my, you know, earn a living for my family. And I quit paintings for about th three years where I created, I'm one of the first uh, people who created rock bands in Bahrain because I played keyboard as well, it started with accordion. Then uh, in 73, where things were financially settled for my family, uh, I went back to sort of warm up and thinking of again, because my dream was lost when my father died. And uh, this painting, which I did out of a shop that sold uh, secondhand uh, musical instrument, uh, this painting was done after a sketch with pencil and then developed in a painting uh, at home uh, in 1973, just a year uh, uh, before going to uh, to Paris. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I have to unmute. Sorry, sorry. I, I just said that I lost my father uh, after uh, uh, this painting. During that time, I used to do a lot of work. Now, from here to 74, I must correct this, I, I uh, you know, I beg your pardon. Uh, from here to 73, uh, yeah, correct. This painting was done to 73, which is just before going to Paris. Yes, yes. Um, Saad, Abdur Saad Abdurrahim, you, uh, you got a, I think you got a scholarship, was it, that you went to Paris? Because we see there's an interesting shift. The previous, color, the previous work had a lot of color, and now we're going into some kind of black and white, some kind of um, focus on the human body. Uh, can you tell us more about your journey to Paris? Uh, as a Gulf citizen, someone from Bahrain? I must say, you know, going to Paris or getting the opportunity to, to go to Paris, uh, and I managed to get a scholarship from the French government. Mm -hmm. uh, not much money, you know, to make it, to, to enable me to paint. And uh, many people, uh, this is not my work. Uh, no worries, I'm, I'm going back to it, go ahead. Uh, many people who, who think or who, who say that I learned painting in Paris. Uh, in fact, I learned, uh, I, I was working in Paris with a sculptor, Marcel Gilly, who was a second generation of famous Auguste Rodin, and I'm very proud uh, to be a third generation of famous French sculptor, Auguste Rodin. And this particular drawing, I went uh, uh, in 1976 in a drawing competition uh, called uh, Grand Mass de Beaux Arts, which was over all the school of art in France. And this drawing won the grand award, uh, which the French government kindly uh, doubled my scholarship, but it still wasn't enough money. 
-hmm. for painting. I carried on. I carried on uh, uh, almost four or five years in Paris doing pencil drawings. Uh, I had two more awards also of Pierre David Bay, which at that time was exhibition award. Uh, but this one in particular, which is still one of the awards I'm very proud of scoring uh, uh, an award at the age almost 20. Uh, this is a figure in motion. Uh, I, I used to do, I must say the timing I had in this work. This is really a drawing that didn't take more than three minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I'm very proud of it because time factor is not really an issue in a work of art. Uh, I, of course, later I became someone who spent so much time on the painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going, first of all, I apologize. There's a red line on the screen and I have no idea how to uh, erase it. It might be something to do with uh, annotation. Because uh, one of the theses I did when I went to New York, it was the behavior of, uh, uh, of natural light, or which is concrete light, and abstract space. And actually, during that time, I'm very sorry that, uh, you know, these drawings were not available to take photo records of. I used to mix color with black and white, even mm -hmm. though I had a lot of problem to shift to painting. Okay, so we're gonna go over a few images now quickly from uh, the Paris time. This is an image of you uh, on a motorbike. Uh, this looks like it's in the Place de l'Opera. I'm not sure where in Paris. Do you remember where this was? This is at the court of Ecole de Beaux-Arts. You know, uh, I had a friend who had motorbike. Uh, most of the French people who lived out of Paris, they have motorbikes because it's easier to get to Paris. Uh, you know, at that age, we were curious to drive a motorbike. Well, I remember the first time I, I sat on a motorbike, I was about 14 years old and it turned over me, waiting for the bakery to give me my bread. <laughs> so we're gonna go to the next one. Uh, here we go. So this is quite a controversial image. Saad Abdurrahim, um, what are the circumstances of this, uh, of know, this photo? Painting is me in a bathtub, which later developed at, for a series of bathtub, uh, which I will uh, uh, explain later. Uh, the bathtubs for me had a lot of stories, whether it's good or sad, uh, but uh, this uh, photograph uh, is really the beginning of series of bathtubs, which I did many years later. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the when I first encountered your work, I saw the theme of bathtubs. But um, do you remember who took this photo? Are you gonna make my wife divorce me? <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> no more questions. Enough said. Okay. So, and here we see uh, Stad Abdurrahim Sharif with his professor at the Ecole de Beaux Arts, Marcel Gilly. Anything? He's the one on the left. Am I right? Marcel the uh, is the creator. He was, I proudly say, was my professor, uh, and uh, he was the founder of Salon de Mai uh, in France. But I must say here, maybe the first and the last lesson he gave me valid until today. Well, what happened? Let's see, this is what I tried to do. Clear, clear all drawings. Sad Abdurrahim. What's happening? Okay, can you guys see me? Can you guys hear me? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Yeah, so I don't know what happened, but let's see where he is. Sorry about technical difficulties. The internet isn't really the Gulf's forte. Um, Stad Abdurrahim, is he here? Bye. So um, we will continue maybe to the next slide until I find uh, Stad Abdurrahim maybe is 
signing in again. So this was his uh, professor at uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts. When uh, Saad Abdurrahim uh, finished uh, his Paris period, he moved to New York, which is the image that you see now. Um, in New York, as you can see, uh, he uh, has moved into a completely different uh, stage. Uh, and, oh, let's find him. I think he's here, Saad Abdurrahim. I am sorry about this technical problem. Um, so he's moved into a completely uh, different uh, stage, which is uh, a, a complete abstraction of his work. And as soon as I can locate where he is, sorry, folks, this is totally my fault. Uh, how do I find the participant once again? Participants, Abdul, oh, there we go. There we go. Sad Abdurrahim, are you back? I am here. Yalla. Okay, tell us about New York, Sad Abdurrahim. I just want to finish one sentence about Marcel Gilly. Yes, when sir. he my work and he, you know, I told him I want to be an artist and I pointed with my pencil on my page, uh, you know, making a dot and I told him I, want, I came here to be an artist. And he answered, uh, if you came to this school to be an artist, you have come to a wrong address. But this was very important lesson for my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, pointed, at the that I did on the page, and he said, "But if you want to be an artist, you have to know where to put this that on your page." And that thing for me is a lifetime lesson. Mm -hmm. Yes, go to New York. Okay, so in New York, Stad Abdurrahim, we see that you have moved a bit towards abstraction. Uh, this is the period of the late 1970s, early 80s, when you were at the Parsons. Is that correct? Now, uh, I don't know if you see an abstract, but actually it's a figure bending on a glass table mm -hmm. with a plant at the back. But there's uh, more geometry. Yeah, I uh, must say, I had a lot of difficulties in, in New York, shifting from black and white pencil that I worked for five years in Paris mm -hmm. to color. Uh, and then, you know, I really have a lot of mess. I made uh, color on paper. This is one of the successful work that came out at really, you know, at, in the second year, actually, 1980, when I was uh, in New York. Um, can you tell us where your studio was in New York? <clears throat> it was in a mezzanine underground, <laughs> where I could, there was a little window on the top. I could see the feet of the people, their legs when they walk. And I, I counted 100% uh, on uh, artificial light. Uh, you know, then I became so, so sensible to these things. I went for a long time in Bahrain working on natural light. Uh, but uh, that's it, you know, this is, this is a pose in that studio. Uh, Sad Abdurrahim, where are the paintings from this period? Do you still keep them or are they sold somewhere? I will frankly say there was a lot of them was missed, but one beautiful work that I could not photograph, and I did it at the third year, actually after graduation, uh, which I titled them, you see, I moved from Manhattan to Queens uh, on in third year. And uh, I made a mural of nine meter width with about one and a half meter high, which unfortunately, or I tell you the truth, it's still rolled in my portfolio that I brought from New York. I never opened it again. <clears throat> that one I titled it The True Story of the Princess Queensboro Bridge, which was the link for me and a lot of immigrants uh, who came with big dreams to live in, and work in America. Uh, I, I made this big mural uh, you know, being, trying to be in the personality of every different person who took the subway at that bridge. Yes. Uh, Abdurrahim, maybe before I ask you, this is a reminder to all our viewers, please write your questions down in the chat. But Sad Abdurrahim, this is quite a peculiar uh, image. Uh, you are an artist, um, and here we see you with a famous politician in the U.S., uh, uh, I'm not sure if you'd like to tell us who this is and what are the circumstances of this image. 
That's Henry Kissinger. You know, I met the Satan uh, once in my life. And uh, uh, I was selected in an international house where I lived. Uh, there were about 85 different nationality. And I was selected with, with six other people representing different parts of the world to be guest at University Club in New York in their annual dinner. Uh, and I met uh, Henry Kissinger at this meeting and actually he was sitting, I, I was honored to be, to, to sit with a lot of important finance people and uh, Kissinger was among them. And uh, okay, well, I want to ask you about, his, uh, about your impression of him. I think you referred to him as uh, Satan. Well, everybody knows the story of the political history. Uh, okay. at, that time, at that time, I think he used to give lectures and flying to different uh, cities, giving lecture university. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, I admired very much his, his voice. It's very characteristic voice, you know, very... Uh, I think there's I, one thing we can say. Okay, so we'll go to the next image now. Uh, so here, uh, Stad Abdurrahim, you go back to Bahrain, and uh, we see you going back to the depiction of the souk. And, but this time it's very different, because you, you went through your figuration stage, you went through the abstraction stage, and now you come back to Bahrain, and you've almost abstracted the souk. Tell us a little bit about this movement. If you noticed, uh, if you noticed, <clears throat> Sultan, the big planes, they still relate to the previous green painting I did in New York. But I must say, when I came back to Bahrain, uh, the, the contemporary art scene was semi-dead, if not dead 100%. Mm -hmm. And I found myself like responsible to create a platform of communication. Uh, at that time, uh, I was close to a lot of expats uh, who, <coughs> Uh, bought a lot of my work, I developed an uh, old scene of souks and villages and villager life, but with coloristic uh, input. This painting uh, represents that period. But after, during this time, uh, I happened to have health crisis and uh, I sort of like, I had to say, you know, uh, you know, I, I must say I managed, I managed to create a, a, a good group of people painting, especially the ladies. Uh, and then when I got this health crisis, I moved to another thing, which was, which I call it more, becoming more serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of those paintings was sold in Christie's, which I called it the battle, which was exactly the painting that I did after putting all these, let's call it traditional scenes, yeah. still exist in Bahrain. And uh, uh, I did this battle scene, which was sold in Christie's. And then after that, things started to develop. If you look how this picture is composed, it's mm -hmm. actually different forms and colors. This is how as I used to sell most of my work, people asked me why I didn't do a solo. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, coming out from the sort of semi-abstracted souk scene, mm -hmm. I made my first solo in Bahrain. I titled it Kingdom of Behavior. Which and is the that, work we have now on the screen. Yeah. Kingdom of Behavior was really uh, getting together organic form, which is the the, the, the yellow ochre side of the picture and the geometrical side, which is the left side of the picture. Uh, and the challenge was to make it work. I went through these kind of thing and then I went through making diptychs and triptychs mm -hmm. of different kind of work. You put them together, they become one you So the, the challenge was in there. Uh, going through, uh, Kingdom of Behavior, I, that gave me a sort of freedom to do different composition of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Abdurrahim, in this image now we see uh, a work titled Princess. Uh, the 1990s was a very uh, instrumental time in the Gulf. 
states, you saw uh, increase in, um, in commercialization. You see uh, everything started to become available for sale. And I, I feel like there's some kind of connection here where you, you start using, uh, you start bringing back figuration, but this work also looks like it is some kind of collage. And I, are you talking about anyone here when you say princess? I'll tell you what, no, uh, number one, I like to make it look like collage, but it is not a collage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I went sort of, still sometimes it comes in my work. I like to make the borders like if they were cut with scissor. And it's very challenging because it gives different mood and different character and space time to the picture. But uh, what's going around Princess, at that time many, many, I mean, I'm not racist, but I'll put it that way. Many poor people suddenly became rich. And this uh, proverb or expression, nouveau riche, as the French call it, which is, you know, the newly rich, uh, they, they, you know, things of, especially the outlook, started to change in Bahrain. Uh, when I titled a number of painting princess, I was really aiming to represent those nouveau riche. We have yes. a question, uh, Sab Abdurrahim from Fawaz Khalid, who asks, um, he's, a he's a concept designer and he asks, what was the inspiration behind this princess painting? What, was there a specific incident? Actually, I went to Kuwait and I saw this, I don't know if she was Kuwaiti or Bahraini, in the middle of summer, and she had all the furs around her, you know, in the middle of summer, oh my God. As money does that, you know, and, and this is where it, it triggered the, the princess. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, here I feel like I'd like to uh, once again bring back a quote from uh, Dr. Maha Sultan, who says about your work in her introduction to uh, your exhibition, Edge. She says, the man with the hat suddenly appears in a bathtub. Maybe Sharif is attempting to bridge the gap between private and public intimate and distant ego and alter ego. You go, you, br you bring this man, you introduce by the late 90s, a man in a hat, uh, and then introduce the theme of the bathtub once again. So um, I'd like maybe to ask you to explain the ideas of this portraiture. Who are these people? Why are you painting uh, Al Capone? Uh, since my childhood, I admired uh, gangster, American old black and white, gangster film. Uh, and I was very much a still a fan of, uh, you know, the mafia films. Uh, but there is a character in particular, Humphrey Bogart. I love this man. I remember my, the door of my room in New York, when you opened it inside, there was Humphrey Bogart standing with a hat at the size of the door. You know, it was like my friend living with me. Uh, the, the idea of uh, the hat and cigar, then series of gangsters I did, which I think uh, quite a number of, of artists did that after that, uh, uh, comes really from my, you know, my love to, to Humphrey Bogart, you know, James Cagney, those days. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was again taken with Godfather and all that, but my love was, you know, early films, black and white. Yeah, and this is, this is the uh, series that Maha Sultan also refers to, the man in the hat and the bathtub. Again, bathtub, we see you bringing in some abstraction and also some, figu uh, some figuration as well. Um, would you like to tell us about uh, this work? Uh, this painting is probably the first bathtub that appeared on my canvas. Uh, you remember the early story I told you, my photograph, and, and France, mm -hmm. uh, this painting, even though it looks so simple, uh, between demolishing and rebuilding, it took about two years. Mm -hmm. uh, but with this, I had developed things, uh, which was I titled my second show uh, in 1999, Pulse. Then in 2000, I made a third, my major show, which I called it Entity. I started to be more curious about what brings me an art, what makes me love art, all these questions. And the answer was immortality. 
Now, somewhere between immortality, I had to find, uh, you know, it's not a recipe or ingredients that you can put it in a painting. Uh, you have to find out. And here I like to say something, especially if there is any young artist watching this. Uh, many artists, uh, when they are young, they tell them, you know, they don't like to talk or write a text about uh, their work. And frankly, I encourage them. I encourage them because text can be parallel and help their creativity. When I started to find the vocabulary of why I came into painting, and I found the answer is frankly the immortality of the work, and this immortality needed to have a behavior and a pulse and an entity, uh, different elements started to come in my work. And, and you know, uh, maybe we don't have uh, the series of the bathtubs. I started to paint bathtub with telephones in them, shoes on them, uh, you know, vases in them. And the aim was uh, the immortality of the image in a sort of, it becomes an icon where you remember the image. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, this is also one of my favorite uh, series. Uh, there is, I think this is the personal take, although the Bushido's Japanese uh, heritage and tradition but uh, I think you've managed to install yourself in this work. Is this right? This is a little bit my attitude against corruption. You know, I imagine myself that I am a Bushido. I'm chopping the heads of all these people doing, doing corruptions in our societies and me a little bit everywhere. Corruption is everywhere. So this yeah. picture, me in the middle with a sword with two figures without heads is me chopping the heads of, of, of uh, the bad guys who are making corruption. Okay, I want to ask you who they are. Uh, now, this is, this is a work uh, that uh, we've purchased at Barjil 10 years ago, and I've never asked you what this work is about. I just fell in love with the composition, but I actually have no idea why I love this work. Could you tell us more about it? It's titled Artist and the Model. You know, the best love is the, best love is the love that comes without reason. And that's the crazy love. Uh, now, uh, coming back to this painting is, uh, as I said earlier, working with different elements. During the, I, I, if you remember, I titled this show, Who Says It Doesn't Work? Another way, I took the freedom of putting something classic next to something out of this world, a wrong proportion, mixing animals with human beings. And you can see on the left side is me from the back or in front of a, 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 an easel, which you can see the red painting, but then the figure, which is a blend of child movement into animal anatomy, uh, or you know, out of proportion. And I think the beauty of this picture is putting all that together. Okay, so um, going to the next one. So now we have a special treat for everybody. Are you guys ready? And you'll have to excuse me with my technical limitations. But I'd like to introduce you uh, uh, in this image to uh, a guest speaker, but he sent us a recording, which I will play for you. It's only a couple of minutes long. And this gentleman is one of the most prominent collectors in the, uh, in the region. Uh, his name is Abdel Majid Bresh. And he sent us a recording uh, because he is probably the greatest collector of the works of Ustad Abdel Rahim Sharif. And uh, he will tell us about the, uh, his works and about specifically about a work which I will be showing you in the next slide. But excuse me once again, I know this is not your work, Stad Abdurrahim, but I am only minimizing the image so I can play to, uh, to you the, the recording of Stad Abdul Majid Bresh. You guys are ready for this? This is quite a treat. I'm very happy to be doing this. I've known Abdurrahim Sharif since 1984 when I was based in Bahrain working for a bank there. I was living in a compound of villas with American and English neighbors who were very good friends of Abdurrahim and who bought a few of his paintings. One day when he was visiting them showing some of his artwork, I saw one of the paintings and I bought it immediately. That was the first painting I have ever bought. I came back to Bahrain in 2003, some 19 years later, after I first met Abdurrahim. We immediately reconnected, and soon after that, 
I often spend Fridays or Saturdays in the afternoon at his studio discussing art. That was when I bought from him a couple of paintings, one of which was a man with the hat, the subject matter of this interview. The minute I saw it on the wall, I knew I needed to have it. I was mesmerized by the composition, something that Abrahim excelled in, the coloring, the largesse of the painting, giving it space to breathe, the line dividing the painting into two, which was perfectly placed, and the large area to the left with the shadows of the painting that gave a lot of perspective to the whole piece and balance to the artwork, which was magnificently articulated. I regard Abdurrahim Sharif by far the best artist and colorist in the Gulf. I would even venture to say he is there as a rising star amongst the best if you consider the contemporary artists from the Arab world. Nevertheless, despite his exposure to the West where he lived in New York and Paris in his early formative years and speaks both English and French eloquently, the problem facing Abdurrahim is that he is living in a region that does not or cannot fully comprehend or appreciate his artwork. The region lacks the collectors, patrons, and liquidity that Western capitals provide. He's also not well represented as an international artist. Bahrain is a very small place. I strongly believe he would accumulate a tremendous amount of support and audience if he were living in, say, New York, London, or even Paris. I personally intend to buy more of his recent work in due course and would have liked to buy a lot more from his last two exhibitions, which are probably the best artwork he's ever produced. Said Abdurrahim, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank so, you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, so again, that was a uh, high praise from Abdel Majid Braish, one of the most prominent collectors uh, from the Middle East and North Africa, uh, who's also collected your work uh, heavily. And he also praises your very last exhibition from which uh, these uh, last two works came from. Uh, but my question is going to be about this specific work, which I would like to ask you more about. This work is titled Angel. Um, it looks abstracted, but it's also very much Middle Eastern related. Can you tell us a little bit about Angel? Uh, well, I'll come a little bit to, to the tools, which is, uh, you know, after so many years work, uh, especially there is a portion that I didn't say it, which is when I was a teenager, I used to copy masters like Rembrandt and, and uh, Velasquez. You come to a certain age that you would like to do some lining and if it tells you it's a figure or it's an animal, then so be it. Uh, I was watching news of unfortunate uh, crisis in the Arab world, which I think is a total result of the, the forbidden of religion and the forbidden of politics, which brought this region, the Arab and the Islamic world, to a total drama and disaster. And I was watching TV as I really update myself on what's happening in the world, and this boy was coming out of a bombing. God knows, you know, how he came out of it. And, you know, so I, you know, I, I remembered the sort of this no mercy on these children or any other religion or nationality. Uh, it, it reminded me that, you know, the wings are actually two pieces of lamb. It reminded me the sacrifice uh, that was made when God was it, wanted to experience uh, probably, you know, Abraham uh, to, to, to sacrifice his son. And at the last minute, he sent him a sheep and it's mentioned in Quran. So I remembered like, you that, you know, if, if, if God had a mercy on Abraham, why these people don't have a mercy on, that, on this child? So I put the lambs of Abraham and put them on the, on the shoulders of this uh, sort of fast than child. And it became an angel. And I said, well, hey, this child doesn't belong anymore to, to, to this world, that he has to go up. And that's the story behind this picture. OK, thank you so much. Um, going to the uh, next work now. Uh, this is a work, once again, uh, also that's very, very personal. Uh, it's a piece uh, in which you bring together the portrait and the, uh, and the bathtub. 
Um, and I'd like you maybe to say a couple of words be before I try to bring someone else in. You like to say, or shall I say something? Yeah, you can, you can speak, yes, yes. Well, I, you know, I don't want to dramatize that, but you know, I lost my daughter who was fighting for her life for five years. And since I did some of bathtubs with faces and them, it's like me getting drained in the water. Uh, but then at the end, it comes a painting, you know, uh, no matter what, as Pierre Bonnard said, no matter what is the subject or the motivation, they all go under a layer called painting. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to find Abdel Qadri, uh, but I can't seem to find him here. Um, I'd like to go to the series. Uh, this, is, this is an exclusive. Everybody, this is a very, very special treat. Um, this work has never been seen before. You are the very first group of people to be seeing these works. And these works are titled The River of Sin. And I'd like to invite Ustad uh, Abdurrahim to talk about, uh, about this work, please. Uh, following, following the disaster situation happening in the uh, Islamic world, and also uh, thinking of the day before judgment, I had a feeling like the way things go is like uh, politics wants us to race uh, to reach that day. Uh, this is um, the first major large work I did after a few small ones, three or two small ones, where I had to decide if the figures have to communicate and have a dialogue between them, or they should be an her heritage of human position through time. And at the end, which is the painting will come after this, uh, I came to a conclusion that after all, painting is a game and it finds its own language and rules. Uh, and then the painting decided how the figures should be, which you're going to see at certain stage how it came. Of course, between this painting and the coming one, there is a lot of work, large work, that for the reasons of time, I couldn't put it. Um, I think I'd like to invite uh, Abid. Uh, would you please uh, say a few things? So Abid Al-Qadri is a, uh, a friend of ours. He is a prominent uh, curator first, but also an artist as well. And he is uh, very uh, knowledgeable about the work of uh, Saad Abdurrahim. So I'll put the spotlight uh, on you. Hi, Sultan. How are you? Uh, hi, Abdurrahim. I'm so happy to be part of this. Uh, thank you, Sultan, for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Abdurrahim. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, beside being a curator or a publisher now, uh, I can deeply relate with Abdel Rahim Sharif's work uh, because we share the same practice. Uh, we, he, as a prolific painter, and I know exactly what are the challenges today to be a painter and yet to be considered as a contemporary artist. Uh, but I would like to talk uh, about my experience in Kuwait for nine years as, as a director and uh, for a contemporary art platform and also as an art critic at the beginning. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for me uh, was actually to find a painter, a good painter, uh, in the Gulf. Uh, there was kind of uh, this connection, there is a gap between the generation of artists who started practicing painting and sculpting and the other generation who started producing contemporary work uh, from uh, other generation. Uh, I, I think at that time, uh, or I thought at that time, that uh, painting was never developed as successfully uh, as other uh, contemporary practices. And this is where Abdel Rahim stands apart. He was from the beginning an artist who really challenged his context. And uh, this all became clear to me during my first visit to his studio when he showed me in his house uh, a collection of uh, pencils drawings that uh, were, uh, they had amazing and so much freedom, uh, freedom in those sketches. The simplicity of the graphite against the paper that were drawing were sensitive yet amazingly full of tension. 
uh, from this series, then we moved to another uh, series, uh, which I had already been familiar with, his uh, the uh, older portraits, uh, such as the Al Capone. And when I saw those auto portraits that he did, I felt that those, uh, they, they kind of, you know, uh, they are kind of a presentation of himself, how he became the foreigner, the stranger, attempting to find his own image in his cultural context. Uh, I consider these portraits uh, the first to challenge the traditional image of the Bahraini Arab artist. Thank uh, you so much. Really, uh, and again, you know, uh, but the surprise actually was today the image that you showed uh, him in the bathtub I think this was the biggest surprise. Abdelrahim, you didn't show me this image, no? <laughs> and I think this made the, everything now make sense, you know, like his other series, uh, uh, The Bastab, uh, The River of Sin. Uh, I think I'm, I'm struck by this photograph uh, and I, I think how in which he tackled these themes of body and uh, nudity continue to bring a sensitivity and intimacy to his work. Uh, I think he, him as an artist, he translates these, question uh, these questions actually of representation into discussion on the most complex social and political issues of our time. And uh, thank you so I, much, Adel. I, I, I have one minute to talk or one minute thank and you. a half. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot to say about Abdul Rahim. Uh, no, we but have so I, much to say. But thank you so much yeah. and uh, thank okay. you for joining us. Uh, I just thank want you. to manage to absorb the art history is quite impressive and uh, he really managed very well to 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 be very flexible uh, very free in how he present himself and how he present his his canvases thank you thank again. you so thank you thank you said abdul rahim i'm going to ask you a question this work has a lot of nudity as an artist from the gulf yeah. did you did you shy from depicting such nudity uh, did you were you ever uh, told off has anyone ever criticized you for uh, for doing works that are nude. Uh, number one, I you know I don't do this to provoke uh, any uh, sensual or erotic thing. Uh, you know I have a lot of small work with, uh, uh, which you know ready for our, uh, the next show. But there, there are another, a lot of nudes in them, and the society in Bahrain easily accepts this. You know, uh, I think an artist should be free when his work, and uh, should the society don't accept, then you know. The, the battle is there. The battle about making them accept it. Uh, who do you mean here? What, what kind of scene are you depicting in the Silver of Sin? Uh, I don't get you. Do you mean what picture or? What is the scene? What is the Silver of Sin? Are you talking about the Gulf? Are you talking about Bahrain? Are you talking about the human beings in general? Uh, Sultan, you know, connecting it to the disaster happening to the uh, to the Arab world in, in the, in the uh, spring uh, mm. of uh, what is called the, the Arab Spring, yes. um, you know, this came uh, as, uh, even though, you know, I am not board member of neither hell or paradise, but I thought of sort of connecting what's happening to the day before judgment, as I said earlier. And these paintings, which are, uh, came to different uh, uh, sessions, like, you know, River of Sin and Jungle, River of Sin Tsunami, River of Sin uh, uh, Persian Carpet, the one who's gonna come now after this, uh, if I remember well, uh, is uh, the situation. Yeah. Now this picture really, you know, if you, the figures, as I said earlier, the painting decides its own game. And uh, the figures became so little like insects and it started to look a shape of a Nayin Persian carpet, which is a mix of wool and, and silk. Uh, and here I want to say the more people, you know, step on the Persian carpet, the more it wore. And this is a little bit the situation in the Islamic and Arab world. The more we have crisis is the benefit of others. That's a good point. Abdelhim, we only have uh, 10 minutes to go, so I'll take some questions 
from the chat. We have a, we have a question from Khawla Al Marzugi, who is uh, a visual arts student at Zaid University, and she's asking Mr. Abdurrahim, do you feel that your controversial and political work affected your career negatively in the Gulf? And, you know, it's like always you have people who stand with you and people who hate you. And, you know, you, know, you can't uh, uh, become a composition that people like. Uh, you are what you are. But I remember a friend of mine, unfortunately, he died a long time ago. He said, if we want to correct you, you will no longer be Rahim Sharif. So, you know, yeah, some people are very negative with me. Some people are very positive. They start with me, but it became a way of living now. Sad Abdurrahim, we have a question from Susie Sikorsky, who is a specialist at Christie's and researcher also on Arab art. Uh, she wrote her thesis on UAE art history. Her question is, how connected were you with other artists practicing in the Gulf? <clears throat> Uh, I have a group of artists that we see each other occasionally. <clears throat> you know, if there is an art fair or that, sometimes sometime they come to Bahrain, they call me, you know. Uh, but uh, I am really someone who goes to the studio before sunrise uh, and I don't sleep at night to tell you the truth. I am most of the time in the studio and, you know, and, uh, socially maybe I'm not, not, not that much. Uh, compared to what I was when I was much younger. Sad um, Abdurrahim, we have a question from uh, Rami Rabaya, who is in, uh, in New York, and he asks, why do you paint on two canvases instead of one canvas? <laughs> Good question. One is, uh, you know, sometimes you'll work on something and it wants you to do something bigger. And you don't have that canvas. You know, we, I'd say, frankly, we have a problem in Bahrain with the carpenters to make you a good straight uh, stretcher that doesn't work. Wood is a problem in this part of the world because it's hot and it dries quickly, then it works. So if I have two canvases that I can match together, I put them together. Uh, it's part of the picture, you know. Uh, sometimes I choose that separation. It becomes like you move from a mood to another mood, you know. It, uh, you know, it doesn't disturb me at all. Uh, Sad Abdurrahim, we have a question from Sophie Kazan, who says, thank you so much for sharing your art journey with us. Uh, do you feel your career would have been different if you were an art student now? And what do you think about the way that art is taught and art is practiced today in Bahrain? In Bahrain? And wherever. I'll tell you what, there is right now uh, uh, this uh, art mania in Bahrain. Everybody's okay. becoming this, which is, you know, socially is good that uh, I consider it it's a, a positive, it makes, art makes positive people. Uh, but, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, can you tell me the beginning of the question again? Do you feel your career would have been different if you were an art student today? And what do you think of the art practice? I'll tell you today? what, one of my dreams is to be young again with the experience I have today. And I'll tell you what, I, you know, I say, wow, uh, it took time when you go to, to, to and look at the mirror, see all your hair got white. I say, wow, can I be reborn again? Yes, okay. painting is something lovely and I wish I could go back and be, you know, 20 or 30 years old. It would be lovely to continue paint. You know, we this is why at my heart surgery, uh, I thought I'm never going to come back home. You know, my open heart surgery two years back. And uh, when I came out, I said, thank God, I am reborn for painting. And, you know, I am a paint -coholic, you know, in a, in a simple one. Uh, we have a, uh, a Joy Gridden who shared uh, a quote, which I don't necessarily agree with, saying youth is wasted on the young. Um, so we have a question from Latif Al Khayyat saying, what's your opinion on the current Bahraini art scene? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk to you very frankly. I think Bahraini art scene was much better some 20 years back. But then, and for those who came into the art, they are not looking at it creatively. And, you know, on the creation thought, uh, maybe a little bit everywhere is like that. People came into art for commercial reasons. 
and they are looking for the ingredients and the formula how to make a painting to sell. And that's very sad. Bahrain, frankly, is in that situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question from Muhammad Al uh, Aslawi from Kuwait who says, uh, do you have any plans on publishing a book which has all your art and your personal photos? Salam, you brought up a very good sensitive thing. I would love to, to see anybody who would like to do that. Uh, yes, I do have a plan. Uh, you know, the problem is how big will be that book? Maybe we have to do like different volumes. Okay, so this is an invitation to, to a catalog on me or a book, I don't mind. It's an invitation to people who are interested in publishing a book on the work of Abdurrahim uh, Sharif. Uh, we also have uh, a couple of young Bahraini artists uh, who are saying that they're going to try to do something about that to try and improve, uh, and they are improving uh, the art scene. I think maybe the penultimate question I'd like to ask you from Khawla, but also seconded by Naila and some others who are asking, what advice can you give an emerging Arab artist? I, I think I put, can put it, as I'm a painter and there is a lot of things happening on the world, I don't want to like, I don't like to say I am anti this and anti that, because sometimes there is a beautiful installation, for instance, and there is a lousy one. I can say uh, one sentence that is really the cream of years of work. It's not what you do, it's how you do. Okay. Um, we have a, a question which you, you don't necessarily have to answer, but it's from Lisa Boleshger, uh, who asks, how do you see the current situation impacting the contemporary art scene in the Gulf? It will see some of the things can react immediately, mm -hmm. uh, but some, to, some of the thing is like a baby in the womb of the mother. It takes mm -hmm. time to, be, to make up. Okay, so um, maybe the last question is, uh, I'll go back to this because it really is the theme of the, uh, of the, uh, of the show, uh, of, the, of this uh, interview. Uh, a question I got is, how come you didn't show the river of sin publicly until now? I didn't, I, the, 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 your voice was, was, was not clear. Uh, how come you haven't, the question is, why haven't you shown the river of sin until now publicly? I still work on that. I still uh, produce new images on this. Uh, I think many artists have two or three different kinds of work, frankly, frankly. I remember once, you know, my, my, my teacher in New York showed a painting and I said, you know, what is this? He said, Rahim, I have so many of those, don't tell anybody. You know, there is always, any artist will try. And one of the reasons that we kept on, I kept on trying new things, frankly, is because you are not put in a network immediately. And that can be positive and negative. Negative that you will be stuck with galleries doing the same thing and becomes boring at certain stage. And positive is your work will flourish all the time because you are free and you are not dictated to do a certain kind of work. Uh, Abdurrahim Sharif, uh, it's a great honor to have hosted you in, uh, on the online cultural majlis today. Uh, I am a big fan of your work. I'm a big fan of your personality. I also want to say a shout out to uh, Abdurrahim Sharif's son, Hisham Sharif, who's also a rising star in art, uh, as so someone I've uh, come to know recently, and without whom uh, this uh, presentation uh, would, have had, would have had even more technical difficulties. So it's always nice to have someone very young to come and smoothen uh, the, these hiccups. So thank you once again, everybody, for joining us. And I hope I see you once again on Saturday and next Wednesday, where we have an interesting speaker coming up, maybe a youth roundtable. All the best. Thank you, Sad Abdurrahim. Thank you, Hisham. Thank you, Sad Abdurrahim and Abed and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.